Well, friends, our first scripture reading comes from Paul's, um, actually it doesn't, it comes from Psalm 136. Sorry, I jumped ahead on my screen here. Uh, it comes from Psalm 136, and Psalm 136 is one of many Thanksgiving psalms that are found in the book of Psalms. And so today I invite your participation as we read this particular Psalm 136 in a responsive reading. And may our hearts be filled with joy and thanksgiving as we read God's word to us today. So please join me. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. God's faithful love lasts forever. Give thanks to the God of all gods, to the Lord of all lords. God's steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the only one who makes great wonders, who made the skies with skill, who shaped the earth on the water. God's faithful love lasts forever. Give thanks to the one who made the great lights, the sun to rule the day and the moon and the stars to rule the night. God's steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the one who struck down the Egyptians' oldest offspring and brought Israel out of there. With a strong hand and outstretched arm, God split the Red Sea in two and brought Israel through, tossed Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea and led God's people through the desert. God's faithful love lasts forever. We give thanks to the one who struck down great kings, powerful kings, handing their land over as an inheritance to Israel, his servant. God's steadfast love endures forever. God remembered us when we were humiliated. God rescued us from our enemies. God is the one who provides for all living things. God's faithful love lasts forever. Brothers and sisters in Christ, give thanks to the God of heaven. God's steadfast love endures forever. I love that rhythm that you hear. And these psalms were sung in the temples. And you can imagine that a priest would lead the part that I was leading. And then the audience, the the participants of worship in the temple would respond in praise. God's steadfast love endures forever. And you hear this echo throughout the temple similar to what I heard from up here today. Well, our second scripture reading for today comes from the New Testament. It comes from Paul's letter to the Colossians. I'm going to be reading from chapter 2, verses 2 through 7. So I invite you to follow along with the words on the screen to open up your Bible that you have or maybe a Bible app on a device and let us immerse ourselves into God's word. Paul says to those Christians at Colossae, he says, My goal is that their hearts, the people of this congregation, would be encouraged and united together in love so that they might have all the riches of assurance that come with understanding, that they might have the knowledge and the secret plan of God, namely Christ. All the treasures and wisdom and knowledge are hidden in him. I'm telling you this so that no one deceives you with convincing arguments, because even though I am absent physically, I am with you in spirit. I'm happy to see the discipline and stability of your faith in Christ. So now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him, live in him, Let your roots grow deep down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth that you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So what do people nickname the month of November? Well, that too. (laughs) November is the month of Thanksgiving. That's right. That's right. Well, last year about this time, I wanted to be more intentional about expressing my gratitude. 
Being November, the month of giving thanks, or the month of Thanksgiving, I saw people posting these, you know, 30 days, they're going to post something on Facebook that they're grateful for, something every day. Others were following a giving thanks calendar that gave them a specific thing to be thankful for for the next 30 days. Some were looking into the Bible and reading a psalm of thanksgiving each day as part of their daily devotional. Well, I decided that I wanted to buy a gratitude journal. I thought, well, my plan is that I'm going to spend time each night writing down what I was grateful for that day. So this is the one I bought. And let me just share with you. Some of you are getting it. Notice that the journal is blank. These pages remain blank one year later. It's not because I'm ungrateful. I am grateful. I am very grateful for all that I have, for my family, my home, my vocation, uh, everything I have, everything I can be and do. I am a grateful person. But have I expressed that gratitude? Have I said thank you to the one who makes all this possible, who makes me possible? Honestly, not as often as I should, apparently. But if hindsight is 2020, then this year has taught me that I need to stop and turn to God and express my deep gratitude for everything. For everything, for everything that I have, everything that I am, for everything that happens within my day, I need to stop and intentionally turn to God and express that gratitude. It's one thing to be grateful. It's another to express that gratitude to God. Just like that one man in the Bible did. You see, each of the ten had a tale of personal horror, but the stories were all the same. The nightmare had grown and crept just slowly across their bodies. There were white patches and lumps in the skin. The numbness had crawled up the limbs, stealing the feeling from their fingers and their toes. And finally, their faces had become distorted, disfigured beyond recognition. Worst of all were the taunts from people when they would pass too close to a village. Taunts of people screaming, lepers! As if it was a curse. Well, it was. Long ago, these ten had been young and handsome, healthy and well-to-do. They had dreams, they had hopes, they had plans. But now that seemed like another lifetime. Now they were simply the walking dead. One morning as they approached yet another village to beg for their basic needs, the crowds were cheering the name that for months had spread like a whisper through the wildfires of the different colonies, specifically the leper colony. And they heard this name that they had heard whispers about, this healer that they had heard whispers about, Jesus. This leper healer from Nazareth stood by the village well, not far from where these twisted outcasts were, and Jesus was looking their way. Jesus smiled at them, the first smile that had been pointed in their direction in many, many years. And he simply said, go and show yourselves to the priest. Jesus did not even touch them. To go and show the priest would validate their healing. The priest would be the ones to claim that you are clean and you can rejoin that community. Well, as soon as Jesus said those words, the ten examined one another But clearly, nothing had changed. Were they once again the butt of a cruel joke? One of them, a Samaritan, turned back to the road, set his face towards Jerusalem and the temple, and he yelled at his comrades and says, Let us go to the priest. What do we have to lose? If the priests throw us out, the people will stone us. What do we have to live for? 
And so the Samaritan led them, and he hobbled down the dusty path, his crutch making holes in the scorched clay. And as the others followed him, as the others followed along the road and were walking and set their faces toward Jerusalem and toward the temple, the miracle happened. They were healed. They were cleansed. No more patches, no more lumps, no more face distorted. Suddenly, instantly, immediately, unconditionally, they were healed. The nine men shouted and raced down the road like they were boys playing a game, peeling off their rags so to welcome the sunshine on their healed skin. They never even looked back, never even saw again the face of the one who had brought light onto their darkness, who had ended their nightmare. But one man, the Samaritan, spun back around to Jesus and flung himself at Jesus, got down on his knees and worshipped Jesus and praised him. Tears spilled down his cleansed cheeks and he looked up trembling and grateful and whispered, thank you. Ten were healed. One said thank you. What is more surprising about this story? That one person stopped and turned back to say thank you, or that nine did not? How often do we stop and say thank you? Thank you. How often do we pause amid life's activities and physically turn and vocally turn to God and give God thanks like the Samaritan did. I'm certain the other nine were grateful for what Jesus did for them. I mean, Jesus completely healed them and changed their life. But only one said thank you. Only one stopped mid-stride, turned back to Jesus, fell to the ground and worship and praise and expressed that deep gratitude for his healing. Only one. Often this time of year, we hear the phrase, have an attitude of gratitude. Have an attitude of gratitude. It's a great thing. It's a good reminder. And we know with our heads, but sometimes we forget with our hearts to express our thanksgiving. We know that God is the giver of all things. But have we taken the time to express our thanks? to God for every mouthful of food we eat, for the breath of air we inhale, for every note of beautiful music, for every smile on the face of a spouse or a child or a friend. I believe that our hearts need to connect with God, to commune with God, and to express our praise and our gratitude, to give thanks to God for who God is, for what God has done, what God is currently doing in your lives for what God will do. We need to give thanks to God for who you are, for all that you are, for all the many blessings in your life. Allowing time for personal thanksgiving, I think, is so important. It's essential to our relationship with God. And an intentional rhythm of time spent with God, reflecting on God's care and goodness It may just save us from the bitter pills we tend to swallow. This is especially crucial for this time we are living in. I don't have to tell you, but there is a lot to be bitter and upset, even angry about. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about how we are grieving the loss of activities and events and celebrations of personal interaction. And there are things that we, that I, took for granted that I now dearly miss and I took for granted. And as we approach the holiday season, Thanksgiving, Christmas, birthdays, celebrations, we are faced with a harsh reality that get-togethers could be hazardous to our health, that the holidays we love and that we look forward to will be different. So we have a choice We can swallow that bitter pill, or we can turn to God, 
with exuberant faith, we can express our gratitude for God for what we do have and for how we are able to celebrate. The reaction of the nine in not turning to thank Jesus, I think, shows us how often we tend to take God's gracious actions for granted. I mean, what if we made it a daily habit to stop, to turn to God, and to say thank you? One way we can do this is to learn from the book of Psalms. Psalm 136, and there's many other Thanksgiving Psalms. Just Google Thanksgiving Psalms. It'll come up with a long list for you. You may even want to pray one of those a day moving forward. But in that that Psalm, I noted that we heard a rhythm, a rhythm of gratitude and faith, of thanksgiving and trust. Give thanks to the Lord because he is good. God's love. I believe, I trust that God's love lasts forever. Give thanks to the one who saved us. God's steadfast love will endure. Give thanks to God who made the great lights. God's faithful love lasts forever. What if we framed our prayers in this rhythm? What if instead of being bitter about what we don't have or can't do or how things are not like they used to be, we turned to God and expressed our gratitude for all that we do have, and we placed our trust in God's faithfulness. I believe that when we express our trust and gratitude, that we cultivate a spirit of thanksgiving deep down in our hearts. I give thanks to you, O God, for my family. I trust that your faithful love endures forever. I give thanks to you, O God, for my health. I will place my trust in you alone. I give thanks to you, God, for my home, food on the table, clothes on my back. I will trust you, God, in your provision and in your promises. Similar to my gratitude journal, which I will be starting to fill out this year, (laughs) there's a spiritual discipline of writing down what you are grateful for, your blessings. So what are you grateful for here and now today? What do you want to give God thanks for? I encourage you today at some point to stop and to turn to God and write down 25 things or people that you are grateful for. And after you finish writing down that list of 25, and notice I didn't say just five. I mean, really, 25 at least. You may write down 50. And then I want you to spend time in prayer And read off that list as you're praying to God, expressing thanks for each and every person, each and every thing on that list. Be intentional. Be reflective. And I think there's many, many things that we can take for granted where we live. I mean, we live in one of the richest countries of the world. And perhaps the things that we should be most grateful for sometimes go overlooked. So let me help you with your list of 25. And I want us to think about what we're thankful for. A glass of water. 790 million people in the world do not have clean drinking water. A granola bar. I looked up the statistic today. 20% of people in Brazos County do not know where their next meal is coming from. 20%. House keys. 500,000 people in the United States are experiencing homelessness. And I can imagine that statistic is higher now. A dollar bill. You may think, ah, a dollar bill, I'll buy a pack of gum. But for 36% of the world's population, they live in extreme poverty. Many in our community have lost their jobs, closed their business, have exhausted their savings, and are now looking for employment. They are grateful for a dollar a thermometer. 55 million people in the world have been diagnosed with COVID-19. Over 250,000 people in the United States alone have died from COVID. A photograph. Many people have lost loved ones. We here in our congregation have lost loved ones, not able to hold a memorial service or get together to celebrate that person's life. There is a lot that we have to be grateful for. So remember, your job, your retirement is a dream of the unemployed. 
Your house is the dream of the homeless. Your smile and happiness are the dream of the disheartened. Your health is the dream of those who are sick. What are you grateful for? Well, for 10 weeks, we have been cultivating a life of stewardship, cultivating a life lived with God and for God. And we've talked about how as God's steward, we must get our priorities straight. We must exercise daily in God, fully rely upon God, be wise and generous with our resources, and use those God-given abilities for God's work. We've talked about how we need to surround ourselves with community, especially in a time like this, however that community can safely get together, and that we need to commit wholeheartedly to Christ. We must cultivate these things, immerse ourselves in them, and not get diverted. And when, when we live this God-centered, word-saturated, Christ-minded, spirit-guided life, we will find ourselves overflowing with thanksgiving. In closing, I offer to you once again these words from the Apostle Paul from the letter to the Colossians. Paul speaks words of guidance and blessing to you and to me. May your hearts be encouraged and united in love, so you have all the riches of God's assurance that comes with understanding. All treasures of wisdom and knowledge come from Jesus Christ. So be disciplined and stable in your faith. Just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him and to cultivate your life in him. Let your roots grow down into Christ. Let your lives be built upon Christ. Then your faith, your trust in God will grow strong. And you, my friend, will overflow with thankfulness. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.